Welcome to um, all of those who have joined us again for the third lecture in our series exploring uh, Edwardian Britain and the context in which uh, Sedrum was working in. Um, thanks as ever to the LTA for providing us with the ability to use their Zoom account and for their support um, for their excellent um, series of webinars. Um, but uh, you know, without their support, a lot of this wouldn't be possible. Anyway, tonight we have uh, Jane Ridley uh, here to talk to us. Um, she'll be familiar uh, to many of us on our screens, both on TV and through her own webinars that she's given. Uh, Jane is a professor of modern history at at the University of Buckingham, has written numerous books, uh, including uh, a couple on luncheons, which we were just discussing. Um, and uh, as many of you have seen recently, a regular contributor to TV uh, and, uh, and radio on um, uh, numerous subjects, but including on, on royal history. So um, I am going to uh, share my screen and hopefully the presentation will come forward and then I will hand over to Jane to talk further. So. Hopefully this will work. There we go. Ready to I go. Ready when you are. Yeah. Uh, well, um, Robbie, thank you very much for that. And it's very nice to be here that I can't see anybody. Um, and I, I, I think that it's, it's, it's an interesting subject, Latchin's and society, because um, Latchin's really made his reputation um, as an architect, as an, as an Edwardian architect of country houses. Uh, and this was not really the reputation um, that he wanted to have. It was generally thought to be rather um, sort of generally rather derided uh, to be a society architect in Edwardian Britain before 1914. Um, Robert Lorimer, the Scottish architect, wrote, uh, and I'm quoting, I've always heard Latchin's derided as a society architect. Miss Jekyll has pretty well run him and now he is doing a roaring trade and has just married a daughter of Lord Lytton. So that was 1897. And um, this first slide um, is a painting of um, Miss Jekyll, Gertrude Jekyll, um, made um, more than 20 years later in 1920. Um, and in fact, it was commissioned by Latchians and painted by William Nicholson. It's a very endearing image. But um, Latchians really did owe Gertrude Jekyll um, a big debt because it was she really who discovered him. Um, and she who was his first real patron, uh, and she who taught him uh, to become the kind of architect that he was. Um, so the, could we have the next slide? Um, next. Next. Brilliant. Uh, so, the, the, this is the, the, the house, that Latch, famous house that Latchin's designed for um, Miss Jekyll at Munstead. Um, and the design was very much to her specifications, but she needed an architect who would be able to um, put it up and do the sums and understand about um, making the roof um, uh, keep out water and things like that. But she had a very clear idea of the sort of house that she wanted. And she also um, wanted a house that would be planted in the garden uh, that she had created. Um, and very soon, um, the idea of a, a sort of a, a, a Latchian's house and a Jekyll garden became the absolute um, must have for the, for the leisured classes of the, of the of, uh, arts and crafts Surrey. So Jekyll introduces Latchian's uh, to a circle of clients in, in Surrey and Kent and places like that who are lots of them their money comes from finance from the city uh, they commute into London uh, they want to have a house in the country but not a house that is supported by a country estate by the finance from all that um, and um, this is um, also the other type of client that Latchins has at this time is people who've retired from India um, come back having made a fortune retired early and want to live a sort of uh, country life. So that was the sort of first um, really important lift uh, that Latchians get. But as um, Lorimer suggests in the quote that I read to you, um, Latchians also um, had married in 1897 the daughter of Lord Lytton. And that marriage uh, was really important. Um, a lot of Latchians' clients were extremely 
envious of Latians and thought that by marrying uh, the daughter of an earl, Lord Lytton, um, he was going to, you know, gain a real advantage in his career uh, and have access to a whole social network um, of society commissions for country houses. And in some ways, um, that was true. Uh, but in other ways, it absolutely was not true. Uh, because in some ways, um, Emily was, I wouldn't say a liability, uh, but she certainly didn't go out of her way to help um, Lutchins's career. Um, when I wrote a biography of um, Lutchins, I, I really tried really hard uh, to rehabilitate Emily, but um, although I have huge admiration for Emily Lutchins' wife, I do think uh, she was in some ways rather a sort of difficult wife. Um, the problem was that they were both, they both wanted different things out of the marriage. Um, Emily was basically rebelling against her background. Emily, uh, daughter of a, you know, her father had been a in, viceroy of India, um, her mother, uh, was a um, lady-in-waiting to Queen Victoria. Um, Emily loathed this sort of society life. Um, she, she, she was cripplingly shy. Uh, she was, um, you know, she couldn't bear dinner parties. She got, the, she, she, she hated the whole sort of exercise of social life. So she married Latchins, who was a sort of outsider to society, as a way of escaping um, from this kind of life. The way of life of her, her mother and 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 and, and her father, um, and um, the trouble was that Latchins married Emily um, in order to gain access to that kind of life. Um, he wanted to be accepted by those those the, 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 those people, and he also, of course, um, wanted to gain commissions from them. But um, right from the start, there's a tension between them. Um, Emily wants to be her own person. She wants to be live this sort of independent life. She's extremely strong-minded and strong-willed, uh, and she's certainly not prepared to be the kind of life, um, sorry, to live the kind of life, um, which means that as a wife, she's totally dependent on her husband. Um, she was a very early feminist, um, and um, she certainly believed that women had the right. Um, to um, do what they wanted to do. Um, so she wrote to Lutchins, um, you would not really love me if I was the kind of wife you sometimes imagine I ought to be. I think actually he might have loved her if she was the kind of life that, um, that, that he, he, he sometimes imagined she ought to be. And all too often she wasn't the kind of life, wife um, that um, he wanted her to be. Um, not only did she refuse to entertain, she thought it was immoral as the wife of an architect to go around sort of, um, you know, begging for commissions. And she certainly wasn't going to lower her to that, herself to that level. Um, but she also became increasingly um, uh, sort of eccentric uh, as um, time went on. Um, she became a vegetarian, which doesn't sound too bad, but I think an Edwardian vegetarian was something rather different. Uh, from a 21st century vegetarian. Um, she lived on nothing but rather disgusting um, nut cutlets. Um, uh, and she was very unwilling to provide Ned with um, a meat, which he far preferred. So um, the, the, the food became a bit of an issue. Um, but then when the suffragette movement started, um, things got even worse. Um, Emily was a suffragist. She believed that women should have the vote. Um, and she didn't believe that women should be violent in support of that cause, so she was against the suffragettes. But Emily's sister, Constance, Constance Lytton, was a militant suffragette, um, and she um, took on a, a, a false name, um, got herself arrested, threw a stone um, at a car, got herself arrested, um, and then um, uh, you know, gave the false na name uh, in prison, um, and um, was force fed. And the point of this was to demonstrate that Lady Constance Lytton, as she was, uh, would never have been force fed. But because she pretended to be a, a, a poor woman, uh, she was force fed. And the effect of this demonstration was basically to destroy her health. Um, she had um, heart trouble ever afterwards. And this was really, again, not the kind of attention um, that Ned Latchins really wanted. 
didn't, he didn't, you know, militant suffragette was a slight embarrassment, kind of sort of terrorist sister-in-law. Um, and then the worst blow came uh, in the marriage um, after that, or around about the same time, in fact, when um, Emily converted to this um, unusual religion of the Edwardian religion, really, called Theosophy, which was a synthesis of East and Western religions, many types of religion. And um, it was it was a difficult religion for um, married people to have because um, one of the chief requirements um, was um, celibacy and chastity, um, which obviously imposed a slight strain on the marriage. Um, and even worse than that, theosophy um, has this idea of sort of reincarnation. And um, the um, there was an Indian boy who had been spotted um, uh, uh, sort of talent, but just sort of, t t you know, just spotted on the beach um, in a whole crowd of boys um, <coughs> by, uh, by the, th the leaders of the Theosophical movement. Um, and his name is Krishnamurti. And he was brought to England uh, to be sort of trained um, for his vocation because it was thought that he was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Um, and when Emily saw this, um, young boy, who was many years younger than her, uh, she became um, totally sort of emotionally involved with him. And he really dominates her emotional life for many years. And again, this was something that I think Latchins found um, very difficult. So um, to say that Latchins was merely a society architect, I think would be a little unfair, um, really very unfair, given the fact that his wife was in full tilt rebellion against society and really um, you know, she was um, sort of an Edwardian rebel, big time, uh, rather than um, a, um, a person um, who wanted to, um, you know, to, to um, work society to her own um, benefit and the benefit her, of her husband. She didn't believe in that sort of thing um, at all. However, I think there was a sense in which, em in which Emily um, did help Latchin's career directly, and that was um, that she gave access uh, to commissions from one of the most important um, sort of um, sections of the Edwardian elite, which was a social group um, known as the Souls. Now, the Souls were sort of um, uh, aristocratic intelligentsia. Um, uh, they were cross-party. You got, uh, there were people, the leader of the Souls was A.J. Balfour, who was the conservative leader. But another member of the Souls, or at least on the edge of the Souls, uh, was um, um, Asquith, uh, the um, Liberal Prime Minister. Um, and of course, Asquith's wife, Margot, was a central member of this group, the Souls. So they don't, they don't, they cross over party, party boundaries. They believed in conversation. Um, they believed in, um, in, in, in um, party games and they believed in house parties. So that it's very important uh, for the souls, the social life of the souls, that they should have um, the appropriate house parties um, and the houses to have them in. They're great house builders. And so with this kind of um, commission, Latchins is moving into a slightly a world where people are living in bigger houses than the houses that he was commissioned to buy, uh, to, to build in, in Surrey. Um, and just to um, look at one or two, could we have the next slide? This is a picture of Emily. I should have shown it to you before. Um, that is Emily reading a theosophical um, book. And the next slide, please. Um, well, this is a commission for um, uh, Alfred Littleton, who was a, a politician, a conservative politician, uh, but also a member of the um, social group, the, the, the Souls. Um, and this house was built in East Lady, it's called Grey Walls, um, and it was built um, for Alfred Littleton, who was a great athlete and particularly fond of golf. So it's a sort of little holiday cottage um, that he had. I mean, it's enormous for a holiday cottage um, and um, shows the kind of sort of um, wealth uh, that um, Edwardian patrons had. And if we could move on to the next slide. Um, after a few years, Alfred Littleton became slightly bored of Grey Walls. It was too far for him to go and it was away from his, his, his work in, 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 in London. Um, and so he commissions um, this um, 
uh, high school, Wittisham, uh, in um, uh, Kent. Uh, and you can see, uh, that obviously it's in a very different style from Grey Walls, but this is a house um, which is, has been described as suavely neo-Georgian. Um, for people like the Soles, Latchins is, is quite sort of reserved in his in his in his in the style of his architecture he's not so exuberant as he was for the people he was designing for in 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 um surrey um and could we look at the next slide which is another um house of the same sort of sort but much bigger this is great matham um which um was built for hj tennant um a member of this sort of social political group as well as the souls, as well as being um, a um, liberal politician. And this is very much um, Lutchin's uh, presenting um, this patron with um, a traditional Whig seat. This is a sort of Lutchin's take on um, an 18th century Whig political, um, uh, uh, political country house. And then um, the next slide, if that's possible. Thank you. Um, this is uh, Lamb Bay, uh, which I, I would put in the same group as being a sort of souls um, uh, house. And Lamb Bay is the most, one of the most romantic of Lutchins's um, houses on, on an island um, off Dublin, almost impossible to get to, um, with this extraordinary um, castle at, at, at the centre of it, surrounded by a wonderful huge stone wall. And this was for Cecil Baring, who was a member of the Baring banking family, um, but um, a, a, a man who liked to live a sort of alternative type li uh, lifestyle. And I think one of the things also about the souls and these type of clients, this group of clients, um, is that they, you know, the Ed we identify the Edwardian era with massive luxury and opulence and enormous meals. You know, there's huge meals of 12 courses or more, uh, which they gobbled up. Um, but I don't think that the souls um, really bought into this um, Edwardian opulence. This was much more the kind of way of life identified with the king, Edward VII, and his sort of circle. Um, the souls were slightly puritanical. Um, they didn't eat too much, um, and um, they didn't have enormously lavish, um, luxurious houses. And as anybody knows who stayed in the Lutchin's house, his houses on the whole are not the most comfortable, um, nor are they the warmest, and nor are the fires the best, uh, the, the best for not smoking. Um, but none of that would really have mattered for the souls because they like to think that they had their minds on higher things. Um, and what they would have enjoyed um, was the incredible geometry and the, the sort of perfection of Lutchin's um, country houses. So I would say that this is one group of Lutchin's um, Edwardian um, clients. And then I just want to look briefly at another rather different group. And they are the Edwardian plutocrats. One of the great characteristics of Edwardian society was that it was much more um, mobile, I think. It was possible to be upwardly socially mobile um, much more quickly in Edwardian society than it had been um, earlier um, in the Victorian era. Um, huge fortunes uh, were earned in the, Victor in the Edwardian era. Uh, and if you were um, clever and gave enough money to charity, to hospitals and whatever, um, you would be accepted um, at court, even though you might only be first generation in your wealth. Um, and so clearly for a man like Lutchins, for an architect like Lutchins, the Edwardian plutocrats um, supply him uh, with um, a, a, a really um, important um, source of clients. So can we look at the next um, slide? Um, this is one of the greatest of Lutchins's houses, um, Castle Drogo, which was he began building in 1910, didn't finish for another 20 years. Um, and this is a kind of, it's, 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 it's a fantasy um, castle, the last castle to be built um, in, in, in Britain. And um, a, a, a sort of, uh, you know, it's almost a dream castle. Um, and um, Latchins is, is, is able to um, persuade his client to do things which perhaps the more puritanical uh, and more sort of controlling clients of the souls group 
would not have let him get away with. The sort of sheer size and grandeur of it is, is, is absolutely sort of um, mind-boggling. Um, and the, the client for this, for Castle Drogo, was um, a man called Julius Drew, who had um, retired early, having made a huge fortune with um, the shop, home and colonial stalls. So he falls, I think, well into the plutocrat um, category. Or well, at least he does at the beginning of this project. By the end of the project, poor Julius Drew, I think, is feeling um, rather feeling um, the pinch because Lachins has spent so much of his money on this amazing, fantastical castle. Um, and again, can we move on for the next slide? This, I'm sorry, it's in black and white, um, but this is sort of a magical um, picture of um, uh, Marsh Court. Uh, which is another of, I would group, another of the um, plutocrats um, uh, uh, country houses. This again is an extraordinary house. Um, it's built of um, a material called clunch, which is sort of beneath the um, chalk. Um, it's, um, it, so it's, 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 it's white with little bits of brick. Um, and this it, wonderful vista um, across the sunk garden uh, towards those rather Elizabethan windows. Um, Marsh Court is absolutely enormous. Um, it's and and it's a sort of temple uh, to um, masculine sports, in particular uh, to trout fishing. Um, it's on the River Test, uh, and the client, who's a man called um, Herbert Johnson, uh, was a very enthusiastic um, trout fisherman. And so this huge sort of temple uh, to fishing, um, to catching trout, um, is built. For Herbert Johnson by Lutyens. And again, Herbert Johnson, it's, <clears throat> I think it's a little bit, at least I'm sure people know, but I don't know exactly where his money came from, but he's often described as a stock jobber. So I think, I imagine it was the city and finance. Um, and again, a plutocratic client with the architect slightly taking control, I would say. Um, and the next slide. Um, well, here we are at um, uh, in Yorkshire at a house called Heathcote um, that um, Lutchins built for a very rich Leeds wool merchant uh, called um, Hemingway, not to be confused um, with Ernest Hemingway. Um, his name was John Edward Hem Hemingway. Um, and this is an important house in Lutchins's development because it's, it's his first sort of major classical um, uh, building um, based on San Michele. Uh, but I think from the point of view of his clients and society, I think what's interesting about this house is the way that Lutchins um, uh, behaves towards his client. Um, he said um, that um, of Mr. Mr. Hemingway, that he didn't know how to spend his money until he met me. And there's also a story about, a well-known story, but I'm going to repeat it all the same, um, about um, Lutyens and Mr. Hemingway, which, which goes like this. Um, uh, they were discussing, uh, you know, the house. And um, Mr. Hemingway said um, that he wanted to have an oak staircase. Um, and Lutyens said, what a pity. And then Mr. Hemingway went away for a bit. Uh, and he came back, and when he came back, um, he discovered that instead of an oak staircase, um, Lachins had built a whopping great um, um, black marble staircase. Mr. Hemingway said, um, didn't I say I wanted an oak staircase? And Lachins said, yes. And I said, what a pity. Now, what's significant about that story, I think, is the very high-handed um, attitude that the architect takes towards the client. Um, and um, basically, um, Lachins is, is, is um, uh, really taking over. He's not, he's not doing what Mr. Hemingway wants. He's just doing what he wants, which is to build a stonking great classical house on the edge of Ilkley Moor um, in Yorkshire. Um, and I think it shows also, um, you know, the fact is that Mr. Hemingway's money is quite recent. And in those sort of situations, the architect is able to sort of exploit the, the social vulnerability, shall we say, um, of the client and um, uh, impress his own, um, his, his, that the architect can impress his own ideas um, much more definitively, as in this case. Um, and then just one more, please, of these houses. What, next slide, please. 
this again is a house for a plutocrat. Um, it was this is Folly Farm, um, and this is this was designed in 1912, and the client for this was called Zachary Merton. Um, and I, I only just discovered the other day that the um, Merton family were in fact extremely wealthy um, German Jewish um, metal um, merchants and metal businessmen. And um, this made their position slightly awkward um, during the First World War, particularly as the way the um, business functioned was that there was one branch of the family in Britain, including Zachary, the, the client of this house, and there was also another branch of it in Germany, and both um, sides work very closely um, together and of course that kind of collaboration between a German and an English firm uh, during the First World War was, was, was going to be very difficult for them, cause problems. Um, but anyway here um, uh, Lachins is doing the most extraordinary things. Um, uh, this, 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 um, this part of Poly Farm is built, you know, on one side there's a little Georgian, rather charming Georgian house uh, and then connected with it is this um, amazing modernist structure um, with um, those huge sort of um, pillars, brick pillars going down surrounding the li lily pond, uh, and um, which Latins called cow sheds. Uh, so um, again, he, he, with, with plutocratic clients, it does, with really rich men, it does seem possible uh, for Latins to be more relaxed and more experimental in rather a way that, that rather a surprising way. Um, now, I want to move on to really the, the collapse of all this um, marvellous um, country house practice, uh, which happens as a result of the First World War. Um, in the spring of 1914, uh, Lachins was at the peak of his country house uh, career. Uh, he had become the top Edwardian society architect. Um, carriages queued three abreast outside his office at 17 Queen Anne's Gate in London. Um, and yet, six months later, the whole thing had toppled down. Basically, uh, the um, First World War destroys his country house practice. And destroys it very quickly indeed, um, because um, uh, there's a sort of stock market panic uh, before the outbreak of war, and that causes four of his clients who were deeply involved in the stock market to um, cancel projects that were ongoing. And then when war is declared on the 4th of August 1914, um, uh, a further bunch of, um, of, of, of um, uh, jobs are cancelled. Lutchins is, you know, within a week, Lutchins is uh, country house uh, practice has literally um, melted away. Um, he was lucky um, because he wasn't entirely dependent on his English um, commissions. Um, since 1912, Lachins had been going out to India, um, to, first of all, to survey the site for a um, new city, New Delhi, um, and then to um, begin to produce um, drawings for it. Um, and Delhi architecture goes on, right, goes on working right up uh, until 1917. So he does have some money coming in, at least at the um, first half, in the first half of the First World War. But essentially, the First World War is, 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 a, is a total sort of, um, uh, you know, it transforms his practice. Um, and if you look at the sort of lists of uh, jobs that he was working on uh, before the First World War, um, the lists are full of major country houses of joyful projects uh, which allowed him to experiment and to do extraordinary things. Um, all that was gone. If you compare, just taking a, a random year, 1920, after the First World War. In, the, in 1920, um, Latchins was working on 26 jobs. So that doesn't sound too bad. Uh, but these included 17 war memorials. Um, and there were three country houses in there, but no new country houses. These, these commissions were just to alter or enlarge country houses. Now, most the, the, the chief sort of big earner 
1920 was a commission for Britannic House, which was is still is today a marvelous um, uh, building uh, for um, financial offices um, in, in Finsbury Circus, and um, this was for the Anglo-Iranian um, Oil Company, which later became BP. So. Um, you've had the, the, this, I think, shows us there's a real shift taking taking place. Most of Latchin's income uh, comes from these big commercial um, projects whenever he can get them. Um, he is spending it, huge amounts of time uh, traveling up and down the country, um, designing war memorials uh, for some for you know um, cities and 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 and, and civic um, purposes, but quite often uh, for the children um, of his clients, for the children of the souls. So it, it, it must have been quite grim. Um, and uh, he also um, is very deeply involved, obviously at this time, uh, with the whole um, uh, Imperial War Graves Commission um, uh, building in France. So he spends a lot of time, if we could have the next slide, um, in France, um, uh, designing graveyards, uh, designing uh, war memorials, designing the sort of basic, I suppose you call it the basic architectural furniture uh, of the um, of, of, of the war memorials in France, you know, the great war stone um, and um, the, the various sort of um, uh, architectural features that are replicated in the various um, cemeteries. There's an awful lot of work um, involved in the Imperial um, War Graves Commission um, and um, Latchins was not paid for it. This was his war work um, and he did it for free. He gave his time for free. Um, and this sort of climaxed, I think, um, with the amazing um, Tietval Memorial to the Missing of the Somme. With all their names carved into the into in, in, into the stone, um, so again um, uh, he is not as 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 well off um, after the war as he had been before it by a long way. Um, he um, come here the next slide. Um, he 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 does become famous. He becomes famous, I think, very largely because of the cenotaph, uh, which he was designed originally as a temporary structure in 1919, and then um, was so popular um, with the people every morning, it would be surrounded by wreaths and um, flowers, uh, that Latchins was able to go to the government and ask Lloyd George to allow him to convert the um, uh, temporary cenotaph to build a permanent cenotaph, which is the cenotaph we have today. And I think that that public architecture, um, uh, 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 unpaid, though I think it was, I'm not sure about the, about the cenotaph, but certainly not very much. Um, that was very important in establishing his prestige, um, but it certainly didn't make him uh, a rich man. Um, he wrote to, em uh, to, to Emily at the end of the war, but, oh, Emmy, money is difficult. I don't know what I shall do. Um, they had five children. Um, they lived in a, in, 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 you know, a, a, a large house. Um, and Emily um, had to be kept in the way that she was accustomed. Latchins thought she wouldn't have minded a bit, but anyway, he felt that. Um, and so uh, money was a worry. Uh, one of the key um, solutions to that worry uh, came with um, another clan from his pre-war days um, called Reginald McKenna. Reginald McKenna um, was a prominent Liberal politician. He had been Chancellor of the Exchequer in the Liberal government. And he also happened to be married uh, to a niece of Gertrude Jekyll, um, and that was how Lapchins knew him. Um, and after he left politics, uh, Reginald McKenna became uh, chairman of the Midland Bank. And could we have the next slide? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, which is still there today, as you can see. Um, this is it. Uh, uh, and. Um, uh, actually, it isn't the Midland Bank anymore, but the building is still there. Um, uh, so um, Latchin's built, builds not just this huge um, building at Peltry, the headquarters of the Midland Bank, um, commissioned by Reginald McKenna, but McKenna um, also um, commissions Latchin's to build St James's Piccadilly um, uh, Midland Bank um, building, um, and also one in Leadenhall Street, and a Midland Bank building in um, Manchester. So this kind of work, banks, um, certainly um, does help um, keep um, Latchin's um, afloat. 
But I think that 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 you know, doing spending so much time memorializing the dead of the First World War, or building for rather impersonal um, corporations and banks, um, it, it wasn't the same kind of joyful practice where he could make his puns uh, and entertain people um, uh, as he had enjoyed um, before the First World War. Um, and so um, Lachin's um, develops a new sort of um, a, 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 a new sort of relationship, if you like, um, and he um, turns his eye much more to um, royalty, and particularly uh, to um, uh, George V and Queen Mary. He first met this royal couple um, in 1908. Could we have the next slide? Um, oh, sorry, I should have shown you this. This is this is this is just sorry. This is poultry, um, as it is today. You can see still the, the Latchin's wonderful green Latchin's pillars, uh, and you can see um, all the sort of desk furniture for the back um, and the windows. Uh, but of course, poultry has had a recent incarnation, um, reincarnation, and reappeared as the Ned, um, which um, I think is 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 an excellent thing. Could we go on to the next slide? Uh, so this is Lindisfarne, uh, which is a, a, a castle on a rock um, off the coast of Northumberland, which um, Latchin's um, reinvented uh, for his very important client, um, Hudson, not just client, I think patron, Hudson, um, who was the um, editor of Country Life and who played such an absolutely central part uh, in promoting Latchin's reputation um, and getting Latchin's more work. Uh, now, I want you just to look, when you look at this um, slide of um, Lindisfarne, you can see there's a kind of fence, um, fencing, there's a path going up the steep incline, and this fence is, um, is, is um, a sort of handrail to stop people feel, for falling off the edge. Next slide, please. This is a picture of Hudson, uh, uh, who was obviously a very charming man, and if we could move on. Uh, well, in 1908, um, the Prince and Princess of Wales, as they then were, um, later Queen Mary and um, King George, uh, in 1908, um, who's standing in the background, um, in 1908, the, um, the Prince and the Princess uh, paid a visit uh, to um, Lindisfarne. Um, and um, uh, Latchins was extremely cheeky. Um, and um, when, he, when he heard some, the, the private secretary saying to the prince, uh, you know, sir, this place has been rebuilt by Edwin Latchins, Latchins hollered out, hi, stop, I'm here. And then the prince nearly had a fit of laughter. He said, how very good, ha ha, and told everybody. He was terribly alarmed, however, Latchins noticed, at the gangway, which we've just seen, which in those days didn't have a railing. Uh, and he wanted a, warm, a wall built. He was awfully anxious to get away when he found the tide was rising. And for a sailor, wrote Lutchins, I thought him over nervous. Um, so that was Lutchins first encounter with royalty. Can we move on um, to the next slide? Um, and this was his next one. Uh, there was a, a, a competition uh, for a memorial to King Edward VII. Um, and Latchins did submit not one, but two drawings for that um, competition in 1911. Um, and um, the um, verdict on, by, the, by Lord Isha, who was judging the competition, was damning. Um, and he said that Mr. Latchins has designed a huge erection of stone, like the front of a hotel, which dwarfs everything else and um, is really all about the architecture. And if this is accepted, there will be public ridicule. The, the project, for a, for, a, for, for a huge memorial was cancelled and instead um, they agreed uh, to just uh, produce um, a, um, a, a, an equestrian statue of King Edward VII and all that Latchins got out of this uh, was the pedestal below um, the equestrian statue. Um, could we um, move on? Uh, I'm aware I'm stuck in a minute. So, um, I just want to, um, this, this here again, Lachins um, in India also, has his, he has problems, uh, he has extremely difficult problems, 
uh, with Baker, which I won't go into, who Baker was his, his collaborator over these designs for New Delhi. Um, but essentially what happened was that, um, uh, that um, Baker designed a gradient joining up the two, you can see the, the two buildings on either side of, 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 of the road um, are um, the secretariat buildings built by Baker. Um, and the, um, if, if you look in the middle, you can see that um, Lutyens' um, building, Viceroy's house at the end of the vista, is partially obscured by the bump between the two Baker buildings. Um, this was, Lutyens really, really, really minded about this. Ba he felt that Baker had tricked him, that he'd signed the um, documents about the gradient um, without um, explaining to Lutyens what would happen. And even in the middle of the First World War, Lutyens attempts uh, to get this um, gradient um, reversed. It does show a slight sort of um, unusual set of values, but never mind. Um, so next slide, please. Um, and so Lutyens goes to, um, goes, goes back to England. Um, and he, um, in 1916, he goes and visits, visits Buckingham Palace and he appeals for the king uh, to support him. And of course, there was nothing uh, that the king could do. And so Lutyens just had to accept. Um, but what Lutyens does begin to realise is, um, next slide, please, um, that um, he is, um, this is Lutyens at this time, um, in, in his mid 50s, as he was at this moment. Um, and um, he, he begins to realise that he is totally out of sympathy with the new post post-war world. Um, uh, you know, the women with painted fingernails, he thought totally unacceptable, as did um, uh, uh, King George V. Um, he himself was less popular. Chip Channon uh, wrote that he despised Lutyens as an architect. Um, and um, the, the houses that, 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 that Lutyens built for his clients, um, there, was, well, there were many fewer country houses, and those that he did build were less successful. Um, next slide, please. Um, so Lutyens begins to sort of um, try and achieve a kind of um, a, a, a way of sort of getting the support um, of Queen Mary, um, uh, because Queen Mary and King George, in a way, are a bit like um, Lutyens in the sense uh, that um, they too are unfashionable. Um, they too feel slightly uncomfortable in the new flashy world um, of the 1920s. Um, they were, um, uh, they, 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 Queen Mary used to say that they lived a, a Derby and Joan life. They didn't like going out. Um, they, they had a very sort of humdrum view of monarchy. Um, and um, Lutchins, in a sense, um, has the same sort of attitude. Um, if we could go on to the next slide. Uh, this is Middleton Park, which Lutchins designed for Lord Jersey with his son, Robert. Um, and um, this house was not a success with the client, who only spent two nights there and then sold it um, uh, in, 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 after, uh, before the war and then sold it afterwards. Um, and again, the next slide, if that's all right. Um, thank you. Um, this was um, Tavistock, this is, this, is, this is Tavistock Square. And um, this, this, uh, this slide is just here. This was opened, this building, by Lutyens. It's now the British Medical Inst Institute. It was then the British Medical Association. And it was opened in 1925. And Lutyens was there to present um, the key um, to the house um, to the king and queen who came to open it. Um, now, um, unfortunately, um, the people in charge uh, thought that Lutyens was far too absent-minded to be given the key. Um, and so they gave it to the Archbishop of Canterbury, put it in his pocket and then couldn't find it. Um, and so the King and the Queen sort of wander around and Lachins wanders around. And the whole thing was incredibly sort of, um, uh, sort of totally unlike the royal um, visits that we have today uh, and um, uh, really rather shambolic. Um, but what this again is an instance of Lachins trying to get closer to the royal family. Um, but if we could move on, um, uh, what this this what really brings Lutyens close to um, Queen Mary is um, his plan or for a royal doll's house. 
Um, and it's this plan um, that is um, put together in the um, in, 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 in the early 1920s, between 1921 and 1924. Um, and the idea was uh, to produce um, a, a replica of a grand, rich house of 1920. Um, it's, 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 a, it's an extraordinary project, this huge doll's house, uh, which was built to be presented to Queen Mary but um, also to go on show, show at the Wembley um, Institution in 1924. Um, and if we could just run through the next um, few slides, just, which are all slides of the doll's house. This is the doll's house uh, from the outside. And here we have um, the doll's house, back to the cars, if that's okay. Um, uh, here we have the doll's house, um, from from the from the inside, and you can see the extraordinary detail of all of these rooms. Uh, on the ground floor, uh, there are the king's cars, which are all in the royal livery of claret and black, um, and um, many of them Daimlers. Uh, and then um, above that, there is um, the library, and um, then the queen's bedroom. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the great hall with an amazing um, marble staircase and an extraordinary um, uh, wall paint of Adam and Eve being cast out from the Garden of Eden, painted by um, William Nicholson. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I should say that I want to thank Country Life for being really helpful in producing images over this. Um, this is the um, dining room laid for dinner with precisely observed replicas of the silver. Next slide, please. And here we have the library, which is one of the most extraordinary aspects of this project. Um, the library uh, contains 600 miniature books, um, all written by um, published writers um, of the day. And so they were all sent little teeny books, um, uh, which um, they, um, uh, you know, they dutifully wrote a little story uh, or a poem in that, I don't know how they did it, it was so small, the writing. Um, and um, then um, they're, they're all these books, so you can see them in the shelves. Um, uh, so if we could move on. And these are examples. Um, of those miniature books, all bound beautifully in leather. Um, and um, move on again, if that's all right. And here again, we've got um, a miniature um, red dispatch box, the King's boxes, which he read every night. And we've also got um, uh, a miniature country life, um, which you can get the scale from seeing the um, 20p piece beside it, tiny published um, edition of country life, the smallest edition. Uh, so this extraordinary, this, this, this obsession with miniature things. Um, there's also a, um, a, a miniature um, gun made by the shotgun, made by the um, gunsmiths Purdy, who were the king's gunsmiths, uh, which was a working model. Um, and you could shoot flies with it, uh, just as the cars that we saw a minute ago were also working models and they, they, they worked on, on petrol. Um, and um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to know um, whether the um, uh, the doll's house was a, a, a palace or a big house, but it certainly wasn't modelled on any existing palace. Um, the only um, sort of evidence that it was a palace, next slide please, that it was a palace, um, is the room downstairs where the crowns were kept. Um, and in fact, there's more um, space devoted to crowns than there is to um, the nursery, I think. Um, and um, next slide please. Um, so, um, this extraordinary partnership between uh, the architect Latchins and Queen Mary, and Queen Mary would come to Latchins' house in Mansfield Street and play with the dolls, and on one occasion she came with the king and they stayed for an hour and asked to be left alone while they, while they played with the dolls. But I think, um, in a sense, what, 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 why this project worked um, is that um, uh, what Latchins was doing was commemorating a vanishing way of life the sort of country houses that he could no longer build. Um, this was a last Edwardian hurrah, um, as Lucinda Lampton, Lampton has written in her excellent book on the doll's house. Um, uh, but it was also a tribute 
to the kind of monarchy um, that um, King George and Queen Mary stood for, which was a, a domestic monarchy um, rather than um, a monarchy of, um, you know, flash um, palaces and um, endless socialising. So even though, again, I fear latchin has got nothing much um, uh, to, to gain except um, fame from the doll's house, um, it, 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 it is uh, perhaps another way in which we can see um, Latchin's looking back um, at that wonderful golden era uh, before the First World War, um, the golden age of the country house, the Edwardian country house. Thank you. I'm sorry to have gone on a little bit longer. Well, Jane, thank you very much indeed. Um, what an amazing um, uh, coverage through um, a very, very broad uh, and just amazingly um, varied period um, over those over those years. Uh, oh, I forgot to uh, do a key part at the beginning, which was to ask if you have uh, any questions, which I'm sure you'll have many, uh, that uh, you put them in the Q&A box at the bottom um, so I can try and field them and um, give them to, to Jane. Um, and we have one already um, asking, given their apparent differences, how did Lutchens meet Lady Emily? And do you think the social distaste of divorce is what kept them together or affection on a deeper level? Uh, Emily and, um, and Lutchens met uh, through uh, Surrey acquaintances, um, and basically ultimately through, through, through um, uh, Gertrude Jekyll, through friends of Gertrude Jekyll, who were friends of Emily's family. Um, I think that on the question of divorce, which of course they dis discussed, um, but never wanted, I don't think that, I think in a way it was a very strong marriage because it, it, it survived the fact that, you know, Latchins was away for, particularly when he was working in India, he was away for half the year. Um, he was, spent very little time at, at home when he was busy. He was always traveling on trains to see his houses. Um, and um, uh, Emily also spent a great deal of time away. Uh, but I think, you know, towards the end in the 19, in, in, during the war, um, they came together and they much more and they lived together and they didn't move away. Um, and I think that it was, there's a sort of a rather, a, a, a rather charming is the wrong word, but a, a rather um, endearing kind of reconciliation takes place between them, and they and and really after he he died, Emily is 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 really very unhappy. Um, so it was a strong marriage in a sense. I mean, they managed to make it work, which was you know good for them. Uh, tying together a couple of um, sort of questions that are coming up um, uh, to slightly different ends of it, but um, building on what you've just said, um, how much do you think? Um, uh, Emily's um, strong feelings in terms of feminism and and her desire for, for in, uh, the society's desire for increased freedoms um, actually impacted on on the way that Lutchens worked. Uh, and similarly, did uh, Lutchens become friends with uh, his clients either through Emily or, or otherwise? Uh, I think that yes, Lutchens did become great friends with his clients, and most of his friends, his real friends, were clients. Um, and so particularly um, uh, Mrs. Lady Horner uh, at um, Mel's, where he did quite a lot of work. Um, she was a lifelong friend of his. And also Emily became friends with his clients too. And in fact, it was clients of Latchin's, um, people called, people called Malé um, in France, uh, for whom he built a, 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 dream, a dream house called Ver at, at, at um, Verangeville. Um, it was um, clients, of, it was through them that Emily uh, got to know about theosophy. Um, because they were theosophists and they had this secret cupboard in their in their hall and um, Emily wondered what was in there in the books and she read the books and they were the books about theosophy. Um, so there's quite a lot of overlap um, between, um, uh, you know, Emily becoming friends with the clients um, and then the clients really taking Emily away from Lutchins in a way. Very interesting indeed. Uh, another one, um, going back actually to the Doll's House at the end there, uh, apart from the Doll's House, uh, how many other royal commissions did Lutchens receive? <laughs> Uh, well, early on, he had a commission from Princess Louise, who was a daughter of um, Queen Victoria, um, and he built the um, uh, uh, the uh, what's the inn at Roseneath for her. Um, uh, but try as he would, um, he really didn't do very well in getting royal clients, <coughs> royal commissions. Uh, he, he had the, the pedestal under Edward the Seventh statue, and at, 
he also perhaps perhaps one he would have valued uh, although it wasn't a very big commission he designed the um tomb of um george v and queen mary in st george's chapel windsor interesting um moving then to a comment that you made earlier on about um uh, Lorimer's, um well others views uh, on on him as a uh, as an architect do you think that the question is here is um do you think Lutchens actually minded being derided uh, as society's architects uh, i think he liked being a society architect but i don't think he liked being derided i mean who would um uh, but i think um you know i think that I think there are society architects and society architects. The thing about Lutchins is that he wasn't building conventional, heavy, um, over-decorated, um, uh, enormous uh, Edwardian houses with you know vast amounts of uh, space devoted to huge servants' quarters and billiards rooms and all of that. Um, not conventional um, uh, a society architect, but but he was a, he was a. a you know, he was a much more sort of creative society architect. And he, there's no doubt at all that he felt much more comfortable uh, working um, with, um, uh, you know, individual um, clients rather than working for a, a bank or government as he did in India. Uh, and, um, and part of the process for him of, of sort of inventing these, these amazing architectural um, houses uh, was essentially to, 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 to work with the client. Oh, very often it was, it was the wife who he got on with best. Um, and, um, but but he, he, he sort of, almost, I think he needed that interaction with the, his clients in order uh, to produce uh, the, the kind of, you know, to stimulate his imagination, to produce, to give, enable him to produce the kind of house that he thought they wanted. Mm. So that relationship is very important to him. I'm, no doubt, sour grapes and uh, leads to, as it's been put in here, leads to, to <laughs> these comments. Uh, it's very easy to derive, deride others. Um, uh, what is clear from uh, the talk is just how much society uh, changed um, through uh, his working life, but equally so does the arrival of, of new architectural styles. Um, and and the, the next question really is, is on that basis. Um, and, and do we have an idea of uh, what Lutchen's impression was of other contemporary architects, such as Tilden and Lorimer, uh, and perhaps about the new, new styles of architecture in the 20s uh, and later um, with, with modernism? Well, the thing about Latchins is he's always incredibly rude about other people's um, uh, work, particularly if they're sort of competitors. Uh, I mean, you know, he 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 was prepared to he was prepared to to um, uh, compliment Wren, but um, nobody much else really. Uh, uh, so um, uh, I think I think that um, uh, he he didn't really rate any any of his competitors um, before 1914. Um, he was interested in Corbusier, but he and he wrote a sort of piece about it, but he certainly wasn't influenced by it. Um, I mean, his own style obviously evolves from being sort of arts and craft um, via um, the sort of Ge Georgian type buildings to um, the minimal um, classicism uh, that you get um, uh, with um, the war graves and um, with um, uh, Liverpool Cathedral and and and. Um, and a bit at Delhi. So he moves to what he sees as a modernist architecture, but it's 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 not copied by many other people. Uh, in a way, I think he's 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 quite a sort of independent worker. Mm. Um, I, I'm conscious of, of time. Um, we still have questions pouring in, so I'm going to try and um, give you a sort of quick fire uh, one some of these. Um, as you said, several of Lutchen's clients were politicians. Did he have any interest in politics? Uh, not really, no. I mean, only insofar as it brought in politicians to build for, I would say. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, somebody once asked him, what is the future for women in architecture? And he said, it depends which architect they marry. Um, <laughs> I mean, that was sort of slightly his... I'm sure there'd be a good cartoon as well. Um, and uh, if uh, then, uh, going to another one, um, if you had to choose one of Lutchen's buildings, which would it be? You've had the pleasure of traveling the world to see many. Oh gosh, I think that's a very difficult question, a very good question. Uh, um, uh, I, I wouldn't mind actually having um, uh, the Viceroy's house, I think. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Go big. Uh, I thought I'd have Linda's farm. Right. <laughs> and I suppose from one end uh, with the Viceroy's house to um, more uh, 
well, closer to London, and so is the other end of the architectural spectrum. How did you come to design the social housing uh, at Page Street? Well, um, that's Westminster Council, but um, I, I have a feeling that the, the Duke of Westminster is also, also involved in that, but I, I, I'd need to look that up. But um, uh, yeah, it's Westminster Council. Um, and then uh, we have a question of what of your categories would Lady Sackville uh, belong to? Oh, you mean what kind of a clan? Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's also a very good question. Uh, well, we can't call her a, a, a plutocrat. I think we have to call her a sort of um, a, a soulsish person. Yes, um, uh, uh, yes she, she, she's kept him, she kept him amused during the 1920s and 30s. She, 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 she was, you know, it was an important relationship. And she, um, she, she managed, I think, rather cleverly to, to keep Ned's support um, uh, and at the same time not destroy his marriage. Mm. Nearly, but not quite. Um, have you been aware of the, have you seen or um, been aware of the restoration work that's going on at Castle Drogo? And a question. Not of, really, uh, no, I'm afraid to say. Mm. Tell me about it. I don't know either. I um, would love to see it. Um, the joys of that's lockdown. So nice. Yeah. Uh, so a final question then, um, which uh, I suppose um, draws things quite nicely together. Had Lutchins lived longer? how long do you think he would have been able to continue practicing immortality aside uh, but more importantly the final part and indeed would he have remained in vogue well he went out of vogue in the 20s and 30s whether he'd have come back in vogue uh, well i think he would have come back well, he, he came back in vogue really not until the 1980s with the was mm. it 1980s with the hayward gallery exhibition that was what really brought him back um, he was out of vogue for quite a long time. But what I really hope would have happened if he'd lived um, would, would have been that he would have finished Liverpool Cathedral. I mean, I think it's sort of tragic um, that he didn't. And that, he, and that wasn't just him getting old and dying. It was also um, the fact that, you know, the money supply um, dried up uh, for that hugely ambitious um, uh, cathedral, which is going to be bigger than St. Peter's in Rome and, you know, typical Latchians, full of, full of, full of jokes and full of, Full of full of um, full of geometry. Quite well, Jane. Um, I'm sorry we've had to rush through these questions, and I, I know that we could continue uh, longer, but um, I, I fear we must draw this to an end. And it's with huge, huge thanks uh, that um, I hope all those who can't speak it would would join me in rounds of applause uh, for, uh, for for taking us through such a, an interesting period and setting the scene so uh, magnificently with the um, examples of his work uh, and, and the stories that go alongside it. Um, it really, really um, fascinating. Um, so thank you so much and thank you to all of you who um, joined um, this evening. Um, we have our final talk in our series. I'm afraid we haven't found someone to talk on art or fashion uh, for this series, but uh, Michael Bolston, uh, eminent landscape designer, will be talking on uh, gardens old and new, and, and again, trying to give a bit of a wider perspective on the field of gardening uh, and the tickets of that on, online. Um, but um, uh, if you've enjoyed it, you're not a member, uh, I would urge you to do so. <laughs> um, <laughs> plug, plug, plug. Um, but um, no, in conclusion, Jane, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you everyone for joining and well, good night. Thank you for asking me. Pleasure.